morning or good afternoon depending on when you're watching this video um this video i would have preferred to get done uh, i would have preferred to get done a little bit faster than i did i do apologize it's taken a wee while um but whether the every bit of research i was doing was trying to get more information that was really relevant and pertinent um, and i wanted to put it in uh, ultimately because i'm talking about such a big issue because we are now actually delving into feminism I wanted to do as good a job as possible of this presentation so that you understand what we are looking at um, in as much depth as possible uh, and, and that way uh, you can engage with it when you're watching um, Killing Eve and when you come to watch Buffy as well. Uh, so what we will be looking at uh, is the four waves of feminism. Uh, it might be a phrase you've heard before, it might not. Um, I'll talk to you a bit about it in a minute. We're going to look at the four waves of feminism where feminism as a, as, as a kind of concentrated movement in the West has, has come from, um, where, where we've been and where we are today. And while we're looking at that, when we get third and fourth wave, uh, wave feminism, we'll start having a look at Buffy and then at Killing Eve as well, and how maybe they intersect with feminism at the time of their release. Okay. Um, for this lesson, I don't think you'll need um, much. I would probably have a pen and paper to hand if you want to jot down any notes or if you want to take down the task at the end. Um, but above and beyond that, I don't think there's anything else you're going to need. Uh, so I'm going to get rid of my camera just now and then we can get started. So the four ways of feminism. It will be a brief he um, history of feminism in the Western world. And this is a wee note. I had a lot of help from a colleague of mine at a different school, Miss Scott Larson, um, who took the time out of her, uh, her busy day to uh, educate me uh, quite thoroughly in what kind of feminism is and where it's come from, uh, for which I was greatly appreciate, uh, appreciative. Uh, so, guys, it is important to note that I have said a brief history of feminism in the Western world. When we're talking about the four waves of feminism and the progress that has been made, we are looking at it from a, a very privileged perspective. We're looking at it from a, from the perspective of one of the uh, most developed countries in the world, one of the countries that that, that, that has the, the, the best kind of reputation for um, equality. I'm not saying that we're perfect because we're not, we still have an awful long way to go. But if you were to compare us to a number of other countries, then we, uh, you know, our, our entire population affords much more uh, freedom than they might in, uh, in, in, in other countries. So this is very much a Western look at feminism. And we'll talk a bit about what that means later on. But I want you bearing that in mind. Every development and advancement I'm talking about here might not have been experienced by other countries. The issues and the problems and the struggles that we face here might not be experienced by other countries or they might be experienced in a different way. The, the journey towards feminism is very uh, individual. It's unique for each country. Uh, and this is looking at a Western kind of view. We will be looking at the UK and America. Uh, their journeys have not been dissimilar, uh, but that'll be very much the, the, the scope of what we're looking at. So the first thing to understand about the four waves of feminism is what they are. So when we're looking at the four waves of feminism, it is exactly what it sounds like. First wave, second wave, third wave, fourth wave. Okay. We will be focusing mainly on third and fourth wave feminism. First and second wave feminism are important to know about. Um, they're important to have a background so you understand where these waves came from. It's handy to have a, a certain, like you should just, without media even being relevant, you should have an understanding of uh, first and second wave feminism. Uh, and then for, for our purposes, third and fourth wave feminism will be far more relevant and we'll look at them in more depth. So this is a brief summary. Um, I would strongly advise maybe screenshotting this page um, or taking a picture of it or something like that. It is, it's, it's note form of everything that we'll be looking at in this PowerPoint. We'll be going into much more depth, but this is it condensed. So first wave feminism started in the mid 1800s and ran till the kind of 1920s. And it focused on enfranchisement, okay? What that means is it focused on women gaining the right to vote, gaining equal worth and equal value. Now, the reason I'm emphasising that is it's not the same as the start of feminism. Feminism dates back, uh, 
as long as the patriarchy dates back. And you should hopefully have the the awareness to know that dates back pretty much as long as time. Um, f- feminism has been a, a battle fought by almost every uh, kind of nation, every group um, throughout history. But for our purposes, for the more uh, oh dear, for the more uh, kind of cohesive movements that have been made in the UK, um, the, the the first one that we will be looking at, the first one that, that certainly history has highlighted as the yes, this was the first cohesive wave of feminism started in the mid eighteen hundreds and ran into the nineteen twenties. As I've said, it's a phrase that refers to Western countries at the moment. Okay, you can look at other countries and how their feminist um, battles have developed, but the way that we will be looking at it very much applies to the West. It predominantly, um, certainly in the first wave, was about women getting the vote. And importantly, it was a key focus on white women of an educated and privileged background. This was true both in the UK and in the US. Okay, In the UK and the US, it was felt that uh, racial equality was slowing down progress for, uh, for, for, for women. So ethnic minority groups, ethnic minority women were abandoned. Feminism focused on white women of an educated and privileged background. You're looking at middle class at worst, but upper middle class and upper class white women is what feminism was all about. This didn't mean that there were uh, no feminist movements um, of uh, for black people or African-Americans in America. Um, there was a famous uh, speech by Sojourner Truth uh, called Ain't I a Woman? And it's where she outlined that minority groups were being left behind, they were being ignored, despite the fact that they have uh, obviously, uh, you know, equal claim to the title of being a woman, being a female, and thus should have equal access to feminism and, uh, and equal benefit from feminist causes. We jump forward uh, to the second wave. The second wave is incredibly uh, important. The second wave is where we start to inform feminism as we know it today. Following World War One and World War II, um, women campaigned having quote unquote proved themselves outside the home. Now it is quote unquote, what I mean by that is at the time it was felt women did have to prove themselves or certainly before World War One and Two, it felt that women wouldn't work in a political um, or, or economic or, or, or professional sphere. And they had proven that they could. It's ridiculous that they had to, but they had done it. They had proven they, they, they had a place uh, in, in, in the, the political, economic and social world, um, professional world even. Uh, the second wave was seeking increased personal, sexual and social liberation, equality in the workplace, equal rights to men, um, freedom over their own bodies, over um, contraception, and the uh, the availability of the contraceptive pill was particularly important at this time, as it sexually liberated women um, and and took them uh, much more away from the control of men. At this time, there was a massive increase in feminist increase in feminist literature, and that's why this is so interesting. Feminist literature predates feminist kind of media as we will be looking at it, but it's nevertheless um, important and worth kind of thinking about. So you're looking at uh, writers and political thinkers like Simone de Beauvoir, uh, Gloria Steinman and Betty Friedan, and we'll talk a little bit more about them later on. Margaret Thatcher was elected right towards the end of the second wave. Okay, This was a massive step for women in politics. Um, this was a massive step for women in politics globally. Uh, Margaret Thatcher um, was, was, was uh, I don't know uh, the facts here, but I would imagine one of the very first women, um, if not the first woman elected to public office um, in a Western democratic country. It was huge. It was a very, very big step. However, it was still a very white, heterosexual movement, still predominantly looking at the upper, like middle to upper classes as well. This saw the steady rise um, of, because it was a very white and um, heterosexual movement, um, after between kind of 1980 and 1990, we see a kind of slow, steady rise of what's called intersectional feminism. And that means feminism inclusive, inclusive of all groups of women. Intersectional is going to be a key word 
Intersectional, you can see the word intersect. If two things intersect, they kind of cross each other. Intersectional feminism is all different types of women, all different groups of women, be it different races, different ages, different classes, uh, be it uh, born with uh, different uh, kind of sexualities um, or, or sexes. It didn't matter. Uh, it, the, this kind of void that had been left in the second wave feminism saw a slow rise in intersectional feminism between second wave and third wave feminism. Third wave feminism is commonly referred to as girl power and rightly so. Um, it might seem like a little bit of a belittling phrase but that was almost the point. Um, at the time of second wave feminism there were uh, very strong ideas being uh, published about the fact that beauty was uh, women being held to a male standard um, and it was it was almost degrading for women to try and hold themselves to that standard and they shouldn't. Uh, you look at people like Margaret Thatcher or kind of powerful women of the time and they're often in big shoulder pads and um, dressed in very masculine clothing because that's how they felt and perhaps how it was, almost certainly how it was, um, the only way for them to be taken seriously. In the 1990s to 2000, um, this was looking at empowering all women, not empowering just the rich, not empowering just the wealthy, but empowering everyone. It was very pro-women. It may sound like a stupid phrase when you're talking about feminism, but when we get to fourth wave feminism, you'll see it's, you'll, you'll see it's very relevant. Third wave feminism was very pro-women. Uh, it benefited from having uh, wave one and two already happen, but it was no longer feminism as it applied just to upper class white women. Uh, due to the rise of access to media, so the internet, the TV, uh, news, radios, movies, everything, it saw new role models for women appearing all over the place. It was actually quite sudden. It, it didn't happen overnight, obviously, but it started to happen very quickly. Girl power was the mantra that was adopted. There was an acceptance of LB, LGBTQ uh, plus and trans women in this movement, which is very relevant. The acceptance we'll talk about a wee bit later. And the emphasis here was on choice. Women had the right to choose what to wear and do. This didn't reduce them or define them. If they wanted to wear a, a cocktail dress uh, and put on makeup and high heels, that was fine. That was their choice. And they should be, feel empowered and do it. It didn't make them any less of a feminism, uh, of a feminist. Sorry, it didn't make them any less of a feminist. It didn't make them any less intelligent. And that was crucial. Women had the choice to define themselves by their own standards, not by the standards of the second wave, not by the standards of the men in their society. And that took us to 2000. And then we moved towards fourth wave feminism, which really started 2010, 2011, and is still ongoing to the present day. And it's, it can be referred to as hashtag activism. Um, these are nice wee ways to remember what each one was looking for, getting the vote, Kind of being liberated and being taken seriously and equal to men, girl power, so reclaiming power for, for, for women and girls of all shapes, sizes, creeds, everything. And then activism, really hitting the streets, making changes, fighting for causes. Okay. Fourth wave feminism is driven by the digital age, it's social media, internet and TV. These are crucial. This current generation of feminism is far more connected to other uh, kind of groups, other causes. It's far more likely the modern day feminists will intersect with Black Lives Matter or with um, kind of the, the movements to protect the planet, anything like that. It's far more likely to see modern day feminism overlapping with many other social issues. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, that is because it's the most intersectional of all waves. It's inclusive of sexuality, gender, race and minority groups, as well as I'm sure many other areas that I haven't mentioned. One of the things worth bearing in mind and we will talk about here is it's also inclusive of men. Movements like He for She by Emma Watson seeks to include men in feminism and abolish male gender stereotypes, which is very important. If we don't allow men to be who they are and to express themselves and be emotional, men will continue not to allow women to be who they are and be masculine. It's a, it's, it's a vicious circle. And we'll look at that a wee bit later as well. The idea became what can you do for feminism and 
what can feminism do for you? So there was activism um, in, in driving feminists to to make change, to support campaigns like Black Lives Matter and the women impacted by it. There, there, there was a drive to be active. What can you do for feminism? But also the question started to become, well, what can feminism do for people? Okay, there was a bit of feminism fatigue, and um, there's definitely still a lot of feminism fatigue um, from certain groups of men. And the idea was, well, if we can draw them back into it, if we can make it relevant, if we can highlight to them how important it is to them, we will get them back on board and we can keep this going. We can keep fighting the good fight. Uh, it is active. Now, active is key. Cre- cre- active is key. Activism is key. Okay, protests, movements, campaigns across the world pushing feminism forward, inclusive and active. These are the buzzwords. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to have a quick look at each wave one at a time with just a little bit more depth. Uh, and when we get to the third or fourth, third and fourth wave, we'll start to talk about Buffy and Killing Eve. All right. And by the way, these gifts are just worth talking about. Buffy, um, as we'll mention later, someone who very much embraces her femininity. Her, her, she wears um, a great deal of kind of nice designer clothing, uh, makeup. She always looks um, very well kept, um, very, very feminine um, by by kind of traditional standards. Uh, but that doesn't make her any less powerful. In Killing Eve, Nico is maybe a little bit more uh, what we would expect from a stereotyped. Um, kind of house uh, housewife okay but he's a house husband or more of a house husband he does have a job but he does seem to fulfill that house husband role anyway uh, maybe uh, a little bit he, he might feel a little bit jealous he he might be um, a little bit more emotional or softer or whatever you might be looking at okay and it's important that these two elements are included and we'll talk about why in a bit so um, now, guys, just so you know, this isn't going to have tasks in it. This is me telling you about feminism. I need you to understand feminism. So there won't be any tasks if you get a bit fatigued. If this is like you know, there's going to be a lot of information. Just pause it, go away, have a drink, come back, carry on. Okay, because there's a lot in this. So when we're looking at the first wave of feminism, it's perhaps the least important to what we are studying. But it's handy to have an overall appreciation of where fem- feminism has its roots in the UK and in the US. And as I've said before, guys, everyone should know this. If you don't know this, brilliant, that's fine. Then you're learning now. And I think it is important that we all do uh, have, have an appreciation. The movements were perhaps kick-started by groups such as the peaceful, uh, peaceful suffragists and the more militant suffragettes. Campaigning took many forms. I'm sure you've hoped probably heard um, some of them were peaceful protests and lobbying um, that was generally the suffragists however the suffragettes took a more direct more militant line um, this uh, th- this kind of could be vandalism hunger strikes even suicide by stepping out in front of uh, a horse um, in one particularly notable case the movement quickly distanced itself from ethnic minorities um, it was because Ethnic minorities were struggling enough, ethnic minority male groups were struggling enough, let alone um, women. And it was seen that that trying to progress um, ethnic minority women at the same pace as white women was going to massively slow down um, the campaign for white women. And ultimately, uh, the the unfortunate truth of the matter is, at that time, white women held held any power that was held by women was held by white women. Um, And so they distanced themselves from ethnic minority groups, um, as it was perceived that they were slowing down the progress too much. In 1918, women in the UK were given the vote. In 1920, women in the US were given the vote. Equality regarding sexuality and gender does not seem to have been considered at this time. And that's quite interesting, guys. We're looking just 100 years ago, um, and at that point, it wasn't even appreciated, understood, or even considered that under the heading of feminism, we should be looking at um, people of the LGBTQ plus community. It wasn't, it wasn't even a thing. And that's well worth bearing in mind as well, how far we have come in 100 years. As I said, guys, I will keep talking about the distance that we've come, what we've achieved. Please, at no point, um, misunderstand. I am very aware that there is still an awful lot left to, uh, to do. So, then we move on to second wave feminism. 
During World War I and World War II, as you hopefully know, women were the driving force behind keeping Britain going, working in the factories, tending to the wounded, and looking after the home front. It was felt and seen that women had proven themselves out with the home. And again, guys, proven themselves in inverted commas, or it should be. Um, obviously, they shouldn't have had to. It wasn't a matter of, oh, can they, can't they? Obviously, they could do all of these things, but it was them getting the opportunity and to prove that to the men who doubted them. Um, at this time, uh, women were uh, kind of uh, sort of during second wave feminism. Uh, many women argued that beauty ideals um, objectified and held women back. They were spurred on by thinkers like Simone de Beauvoir, um, whose 1949 *The Second Sex* uh, explained gender as a social construct. This is a wildly important idea, and it's often unappreciated even today. What it means when you talk about uh, gender being a social construct is that gender and gender norms and gender stereotypes are things that we have created and imposed on ourselves. They're not inbuilt into our DNA. They're not part of nature. We created gender stereotypes. We created um, gender norms. We created gender itself. Women in dresses and men in suits. Women at home and men at work. These are all gender stereotypes. And all of them have been created by us. None of them are biological. None of them are, are, are necessarily natural as it were. These are gender stereotypes and they are a social construct. Something we have made historically perhaps and uh, then use to enforce a, a very rigid narrow view of the world and you'll probably understand without me getting to fourth wave feminism or anything like that that that's very relevant today as well it continues to be relevant then we look at uh, things like betty friedman's the feminine mystique 1963 staunchly rejected domesticity um, and it became a bestseller so again you're seeing this rise in the feminist voice it might not be with media as we know it but it's still very relevant Gloria Steinem's radical feminist magazine, Miss, was a 1970s favourite. Again, steady progress. You can just track it, moving through the years, keeping up this feminist battle. Interestingly, this movement seemed to promote a reduction in femininity. Uh, it was argued that femininity was a male construct. Dresses and makeup, um, jewellery, things like that. It was all a male construct and to be taken to sorry to be taken seriously, women should dress and act in a more stereotypically male manner because they were fighting on a male stage, as it were. And at the time, um, you like it's it's very easy to look back now and go ah that's maybe th think that's ridiculous. But at the time, uh, it was very much the case that they were fighting on a male stage and they had to do whatever they could to get a footing. And it was this second wave of feminism, this 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 wave that got people like Margaret Thatcher into positions of power, that saw women starting to establish themselves in politics or in business um, or, or maybe in the media itself. It was this wave of feminism that laid the groundwork for what came next. And what came next, obviously, is third wave feminism. Third wave feminism was very pro-woman, as previously stated. Now, this doesn't mean that they hated men by any measure, but the movement focused entirely on women. This wave benefited hugely from the first and second wave, as we said, but it had its flaws. It sought to be far more inclusive and intersectional. Uh, it saw the sisterhood, as it were, accepting the LGBTQ plus and trans community into their definition of what it was to 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 be uh, female and uh, under their fight for feminism, okay, and that was huge. That was a massive step forwards. It's not something that we saw in stage two, wave two. Uh, the fight for feminism was a personal one for the individual. This is a key idea for third wave feminism. Each fight is personal to you. How you want to fight it, what you want to achieve from it, that is your own fight. Is what they argued. You could be supported, you could be bolstered, but your understanding of feminism and how you wanted to express it and explore it, that was up to you. If a woman wanted to wear a short skirt, a suit or dungarees, it did not reduce her worth. It did not impact 
her ability to be a feminist and it should not impact her possible con contribution to society. This is what they were fighting for. Now you will know, you will all know today that, that is still not the case in every, every element of society, that women still have to fight the good fight, that there are companies that have women should wear high heels in their dress code. There are schools where women uh, where, where young women have to wear um, skirts instead of being allowed to wear trousers. Uh, there, it, it, it is still a fight that is ongoing. Um, but, but here and today, uh, not here and today, but back then and that day, this was the fight they were undertaking and they made big strides. Uh, the ideal being pushed here was that beauty and intelligence were not mutually exclusive. There was no one definition of female or of feminine. And that is crucial. That and the idea that it is a personal choice because it was your own personal choice of what it was to be a woman and what it was to be feminine that defined it in that moment. No other person could define it for you. No one could give one rigid definition because there wasn't one. Women are, as, as are men, inc incredibly complex and different. To try and define them with a, a blanket uh, kind of statement it's ridiculous. It's as ridiculous now as it was back then. And that's what they were fighting. This was a massive step forward for previously unappreciated feminist groups, such as the LGBTQ plus community and even ethnic minority groups. Feminism for everyone. Feminism started to have a more global intersectional outlook. It began to focus on issues such as female genital mutilation, black rights and safety. Now, put the emphasis on began. Um, feminism and the activism that we, 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 we are aware of and hopefully many of us take part in uh, in today's society wasn't maybe as active back then. So although uh, f female genital mutilation, black rights and safety was all taken into account for um, in feminism back then, although it was included in the fight, we might find that uh, the fight itself is far more proactive today. Might, not necessarily. It depends um, when and who you're looking at, et cetera, et cetera. But certainly these issues, um, this intersectional element was very much established in third wave feminism. Now we're going to start looking at third wave feminism and media. Media in general first, and then we'll start talking about Buffy. Though the media obviously existed prior to third wave feminism, it was in third wave uh, in the third wave that feminism started to be changed and shaped by the media. Uh, I'm not saying that the media dictated how feminists should act and anything like that, though it almost certainly tried. And um, what I mean is, increasingly powerful uh, symbol of celebrity allowed strong female role models to rise out of the 90s, leading this new wave of feminism, I should say, of feminism there, and I'm just going to change it, leading this new wave of feminism, taking it into our TVs, into our computers, and subsequently, obviously, into our homes. Mm -hmm. Feminism was no longer just for the elite, just for the upper classes, the, the, the uh, extensively educated. It was now for everyone. Everyone could get on board. Everyone could get involved. And in being for everyone, what feminism stood for had to change. It couldn't be defined by a small white elitist group, as it had been in the past. It could no longer tell women that they had to conform to one gender ideal to be taken seriously. It had to apply and it had to, to attach to everyone, every definition of women had to be much more open than it was. Objectification and sexualization of women, which had been rife in the media for decades and would continue to be so, was reclaimed in a way. Madonna and the Spice Girls preached girl power whilst also embracing their own sexuality, beauty and femininity. Uh, some groups took a harder approach. Riot Girls, um, an underground punk movement, rejected the idea of female victimhood and sought to undermine sexist by reclaiming words like bitch and slut and creating feminist zines. These are zines, they're small leaflet-like publications um, which were littered with words like bitch and slut, um, but in a, in, in a positive way, in a positive message. Um, it's not the first time that uh, groups have subverted um, 
language that would otherwise be used to uh, to to degrade them and claimed it back themselves. Um, if you uh, listen to a number of uh, black uh, rap artists or singers, um, they reclaim what would have previous what what would still today be considered racist language, um, but for themselves they claim it as their own. And in doing so, they take back that power that that word sought to to take away from them. And the same thing was being done here. Words like bitch and slut were the the, the idea was to take these the, these these phrases back and empower women with them instead of having these phrases used to take power from women. Key thing here, guys, is that. Madonna and the Spice Girls um, and, and many, many other um, kind of group singers and things like that established themselves as powerful whilst also establishing themselves as, uh, as, as, as very attractive and, and embracing their, sexu like their sexuality and, and embracing their femininity. Uh, and that was something that hadn't been done before. This was new. Previously, women had had to uh, ignore or discard kind of uh, more more feminine attributes um, and, 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 and appearances to be taken seriously. Now we had uh, women embracing their femininity and their power. And that was a huge step forwards. We're into gift territory now, if you hadn't gathered. Um, these gifts will make sense when I'm through the, the slide. Just now it just looks like uh, random violence. Uh, third wave feminism and Buffy, that's what we're going to be looking at just now. Um, that's going to be obviously our key focus when we're looking at feminism um, over the course uh, of the, over the beginning of this course will be Buffy and Killing Eve. Um, I am hoping to go on and look at Joker as well um, as a, it will actually be quite a natural progression if we look at feminism in the fourth wave and then talk a bit about um, uh, kind of white male rage. Um, but just now it's going to be uh, Buffy and Killing Eve. So when we're looking at third wave feminism and Buffy, Joss Whedon's Buffy first aired in 1997. Now remember, third wave feminism ran from the 1990 to 2000. Um, like some people will give you slightly different dates, but that's the core. Um, so it was arguably Buffy came out at the peak of third wave feminism. Uh, and it came at an interesting time for women in horror as well. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, franchises such as Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th, uh -huh. uh, set up strong, terrifying, and seemingly indestructible male villains. And it was the villains that were the draw for the franchise. Um, same villains in every movie, different heroes. Okay. And that was crucial. It was always Jason, or it was always Freddy Krueger. But the heroes changed. Though any one specific film might have a female lead, and, you know, they might have, uh, these leads were interchangeable and more often than not female characters were killed graphically while scantily clad following a sexual encounter now if you are a fan of these kind of horrors um, or you go and watch um, any of the jason movies or the uh the nightmare on elm street movies uh, or, or anything like that what you will notice is that's a worryingly true statement Okay, here are the first two gifts. When I looked up, um, actually, no, it was like the first and the third. Um, one of them was Kevin Bacon getting killed, and that didn't help my point as much. But here are two of the first three gifts that came up when I looked up um, Friday the 13th uh, kill gifts. One is a woman uh, in a shower, obviously very scantily clad, being attacked by Jason with a shard of mirror. And the other is a woman literally in the, the throes of passion, uh, getting uh, killed by a big spear going straight through them okay uh, the the dominant kind of trope was that women um who had sex or women who got drunk or did anything that was considered perhaps not very ladylike would be the first to go and that's a trope that survived long uh, long past the 1990s um, and actually, if you've seen things like Cabin in the Woods, uh, it gets mocked and subverted in some more modern forms of horror. Often female characters, especially petite, beautiful blonde characters, come sa, served as a warning against promiscuity, vanity, drinking, drugs, and generally behaviour not considered ladylike. 
they had one simple rule, and this was the rule of the victim. They had to die. They had to die graphically, and they had to die at the hands of a male villain. Often someone they, wind, they would wind up knowing in order for a hero to surface. Now, this is quite interesting. Um, the, the, the inclusion of women in these movies as leads was a step forward in a way um, for, for feminism. But as we'll talk about, Buffy served as the real step, um, step forwards. In 1996, Scream was released. Now, Scream's quite interesting. It satirised and inverted a lot of the expectations that these movies had created um, and actually created new expectations for horror. One key element of Scream was the lone survivor, generally a female character who is intimately connected to the serial killer. So her friends will all die, die around her in gruesome ways. She will at first be kind of scared and panicked and then her resolve will steadily grow and she will finally make one last stand, probably with someone else, the other person will die, but she will one-up the villain and she will survive. And then the, bill, the villain will vanish in an unfortunate and or unlikely circumstance and, uh, and, and will have to come back another day. And that's something that Scream established. This lone survivor, this, this kind of uh, character who, who might actually win out. It's generally important to note that the lone survivor tends to be the quieter, more bookish, uh, less gregarious, outgoing, less likely to drink, less likely to do drugs, less likely to have sex. Um, they, they tend to still embody the more ladylike qualities um, uh, that, that, that keep you safe. But on top of that, they also manage to overcome the villain. That brings us to Buffy. Buffy changed her understanding of women in horror, women in the media, and pushed the boundaries of media in a way that would redefine feminism on TV and probably in film as well, to be honest. Instead of having the beautiful blonde cheerleader, oh, that's meant to be a gif and it's not moving. I am disappointed. Uh, sorry, instead of having the beautiful blonde cheerleader as a vapid, promiscuous idiot whose only job is to die, Buffy was written as the hero of the story. Not in some last survivor accidental terror consumed way where she spends most of the film running and screaming and then only at the end resolves to find her strength, but as a strong independent hero from the start, saving others, including male characters, all the way through from episode one. It was massive. It was different. This was new. No one had done anything like this before. This was a petite cheerleader. Absolutely kicking the snot out of everyone and it was interesting because it had never been done um, some people hated it as we'll talk about in a wee bit um, but I think it's brilliant and uh, the first season's a little bit slow and if you have started watching it you will know that now but once you get past season one and by the way season one has some brilliantly cheesy moments that I think are, are, are delightful but once you get past season one it really finds its feet as, as, as a, a social and political commentary, as, as an interesting piece of media, and as a brilliant TV show, just well worth watching. Um, on top of this, the show had incredibly strong intersectional feminist uh, sorry, undertones. It had strong female villains and heroes throughout. Uh, and one of the things we'll talk about when we watch it is the opening scene. Because the opening scene to season one, episode one, is brilliant. It tells you everything you need to know about Buffy. And Buffy isn't even in it. It has love-struck male vampires in constant need of saving uh, with, uh, with lots of whining about their feelings, which is brilliant because you have Buffy in this much more traditionally male role and these big, giant, burly guys kind of coming and, and confessing and, and, and generally fulfilling what we had to, up until this point been led to believe was a very female kind of role in a relationship on tv in general they were far more emotional far more likely to be prone to 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 jealousy and um, things like that and obviously jealousy is a human emotion not female the idea that women are more emotional than men is 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 is, is ridiculous everyone has emotions it's just until now media and society had told men that they had to bottle theirs up and the men who had emotions weren't really men this challenged that in a massive way and equally it challenged it on the other side. It said women uh, who, who decide to uh, 
uh, be as strong as they can be for the people around them who take on what would have traditionally been a more male role. It's, it's fine. If anything, that's great. If that's what they want to do, and if that helps support the people around them, brilliant. It also had um, allusions to uh, domestic abuse and date rape. Um, interesting, obviously, they had to do it in a way that was still true to Buffy. So in the domestic abuse episode, um, it's with uh, an evil robot. And in the date rape episode, the two women in question are drugged uh, and then sacrificed to a giant snake. Um, but if you can't see the metaphors in that, I'm not going to explain them to you. Uh, LGBTQ plus relationships were included, especially laterally and very much pushed forwards. Uh, toxic masculinity um, is explored towards the latter seasons in a massive, very powerful, very distressing way. White male rage is included as well and much, much more. Male characters could be vulnerable. They could talk about their feelings. They could be softer. They could be sweeter, kinder than they had perhaps been portrayed in the media before. And female characters could kick butt and they could be heroes and villains and they could dictate the story and they had power. And that was huge. Not accidental, it's the end of the movie and we need the villain to kind of half die power um, like in Scream, but real genuine power. Not just the Slayer. We're not talking just supernatural power uh, afforded to one person. You can look at the women throughout the show, all the women in the show, and well, not all of them. Some of them aren't powerful because and the reality is not everyone is, is, is that kind of strong, outgoing, powerful personality. Some people are introverted or quiet. Some people are weak. But that's true of men and women. And the show deals with that very, very well. Oh, I have another slide on Buffy. Well, I've probably covered some of this already. Uh, so Buffy pushed the boundaries of what had been seen in media before and what was acceptable. The show received so many complaints from so many groups throughout the entirety of its run. Uh, it was, I think at the time it might have been one of the most, if not the most complained about show on television and it just kept going. It had complaints on religious grounds saying that it was a cult and had dangerous demonic attach uh, attachments. I had complaints from multiple mother groups. Now I put mother groups because there's hundreds of them. Mothers across America and things like that. Um, if you look it up, you'll find them. Who said it glorified violence and immorality um, and, and basically taught uh, young ladies not to be ladylike. Um, it had complaints from numerous bodies citing the depiction of an LGBT relationship as wrong, uh, which obviously it's not. And, and that's ridiculous. Uh, so it is, and guys, this is crucial. Buffy was huge and wildly important for its time. Like so many shows, it's really important that you note Buffy is by no means the perfect feminist, inclusive, intersectional, forward-thinking show by today's standards. Because it wasn't made today. It was made in 1990. And in 1990, it was well ahead of the time. It did tons. And it did miles more. And it was miles ahead than any other form of media at that time revolutionised our understanding of women in the media, our understanding of the LGBTQ plus community in the media. It revolutionised what feminism was in the media. And that was huge. It would be very easy to criticise it and pick apart episodes and bits and pieces from our understanding of feminism and our understanding of the LGBTQ plus community today, especially uh, if you see what happens, um, well, no, I'll wait for that. Um, but at the time, it was brilliant. It pushed everything forward. Still brilliant, by the way. It's still well worth watching. That's why we're going to some of it. Um, the key areas that we're going to focus on will be the portrayal of women in the media, the portrayal of LGBTQ plus um, community in the media, the portrayal of race and minority groups in the media. And we'll be looking at that because it's probably Buffy the Vampire Slayer's weakest area. It's the area that they perhaps fall down on um, the most uh, because there, 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 there is for a time where there was uh, great diversity in America, there isn't a huge amount of diversity in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. But we'll look at the diversity there was and we'll talk about what, whether or not that represents steps forwards or not at the time. You might be sitting here thinking, mm, 
these don't seem like feminist issues. These seem like LGBTQ plus issues and, uh, and, and, and racial issues. But as I said, this is a time of intersectionality. Women appreciated that. To, to really fight for feminism, you needed to support the LGBTQ plus women. You needed to support women of ethnic minority background as well. And finally, we'll look at Buffy's portrayal of male rage and toxic masculinity in the media because it is crucial and it will lead us really well into Joker if I find a way for us to study Joker um, next, uh, like after summer. That brings us on to, oh, and this gif is me being excited about it and probably you guys and your reaction to all of this. Well, I click forward. It's a great gif. So, that brings us to fourth wave feminism. Fourth wave feminism uh, began in 2010 and it is still ongoing today. We are living in a time of fourth wave feminism. It is shaped and driven by the digital world that we live in. It's seen huge leaps in the usage of social media, massively increased access to multiple forms of media with greater represent sorry, representation within those forms of media and a growing acceptance of and attention to the voice of minority groups, be it sexuality, gender, ability, or race. Fourth wave feminism is feminism at its most intersectional. So far, anyway. At this stage, feminism becomes slightly more difficult to define, and I want to make you aware of that. Um, I'm sure there were um, kind of minority groups in other stages of feminism as well, more extreme groups, things like that, groups that had different ideas um, and ideals. Uh, but certainly I am more aware of the minority groups and fourth wave feminism. Women will take different approaches and have different ideals and definitions of what feminism is. Most of them, the vast majority, though there might be slightly different approaches and ideals, will converge on the key points and will be very much able to walk hand in hand with one another. The majority of them follow a more liberal example of what feminism is. And this is the definition and the line that we will be looking at. I am acknowledging there are small, very small radical groups, they do not define the movement. Okay? You cannot define a movement by its smallest, most radical groups. A movement, by the way, not necessarily anything else. What I'm saying there is um, there are, in some places in the world, there are Buddhist monks who go around uh, scalping people from other religions. Um, there will be equally um there the, you know there have been in the past christian groups that did equally heinous things to uh communities that believed in other groups uh it's not other groups sorry other gods um there will be across almost any religion or any group you look at there are small sects i mean actually for christianity it was huge sects because uh because um at the, at, at, at the time um, we, we weren't very accepting and that's not the fault of Christianity that was just the fault of the world that we lived in and what's important to accept is small groups letting the side down does not define the side in fact they do <coughs> sorry um, and so we will be looking at the, the, the liberal definition of feminism and the people who would follow that kind of ideal Though third wave feminism was more inclusive, it did have a long way to go. It had little to no regard um, for men or for groups out with the Western Hemisphere. Uh, because issues such as female genital mutilation didn't impact Western feminists, they were perhaps underrepresented in third wave feminism. That is not to say they weren't represented, because they were. The issue was raised, but really the progress that was made was still made in the West. And this is why it starts to become really difficult to talk about the waves of feminism uh, in any way uh, in, on, on, on a global sphere. Because as you can start to see, while women in the West are fighting to be taken more seriously in work, to be afforded the same um, kind of rights as men in terms of um, maybe... Um, employment uh, and, and on the political sphere, there are still women in other countries who face the, the, the very, very grim reality of female genital mutilation. And that represents two very, very different um, kind of places on the, uh, on the path to feminism. And also perhaps suggests that no two paths towards true feminism are 
are going to be the same for any two countries. And you have to appreciate that. Um, there's a move away from binary definitions, um, a, a, a move that is appreciating that um, gender and sexuality are too difficult to define in such narrow ways, in binary ways. What I mean by binary is uh, if, if something is binary, it either is or isn't. It's one or other. Okay? Binary means you're kind of pegging a label onto everything. And there's been a big move away from that. Uh, there's been a much greater account um, of all people being taken in. Um, I'll put account there twice. Wow. A greater account for all people being taken into account. Good job, Mr. Corbett. Um, no, but that doesn't matter. What, what I'm saying there is no longer does, and this was started in, um, in third wave feminism, but now um, this move away from binary definitions is, is, is much, much greater making it much more inclusive, um, specifically right now of the trans community, um, but LGBTQ plus um, community in general um, are, are hopefully seeing the, the, the benefit of fourth wave feminism um, in a big way. You can actually see things like that in the legalization of gay marriage in multiple countries around the world. The fourth wave has seen people mobilise and organise through social media, starting movements through blogs like Malala Yousafzai, viral videos um, through groups like Pussy Riot, uh, collectors such as Sisters Uncut, and TED Talks uh, from Chimamanda, Chimamanda uh, and I'm afraid I don't know how to pr uh, pronounce their surname, uh, and from Pro, ah, sorry, I'm protesting widely against sexual harassment and assault, domestic violence, period, poverty, paternity, leave and equal pay. The thing to bear in mind, guys, here is that these are groups from all over the world, different groups all over the world. They're fighting for, for very, very different things. They're fighting for whatever is relevant to their community and to them. And that's important. And again, it emphasizes that although we might be in the fourth wave of feminism, that's not going to be expressed everywhere. This is perhaps what is earned at the association with activism. There are numerous campaigns that have been created over the last few years. Laura Bates' Everyday Sexism, Nimco Ali's um, anti-FGM campaigns, that's meant to say anti, uh, Roberta Kaplan and Tina Tichen, uh, Time's Up, and Emma Watson, He For She, to name but a few. One of the other key differences is that there is now a drive to make feminism accessible and beneficial to men. This might seem counterintuitive, however, it's a wildly important step. Destroying gender stereotypes for women is only one side of the coin. Male gender stereotypes still very much exist, and until they're tackled, issues such as toxic masculinity and white male rage will continue. And that's what we're going to look at a little bit just now. In a minute. Sorry, fourth wave feminism in the media. So fourth wave feminism as previously as previously stated, sorry, this hasn't been a good word stay for me, uh, has been shaped and defined by the media world. It's not to say that it's been created by the news or that it's defined by social media, but that the course it has run, the breadth and depth of the impact it is creating is as a result of media. Our capability to contact and correct each other, share ideas and ideals, share messages and morals, share common values and virtues, our ability to educate and inform, to protest, take part, enlighten ourselves and enable change. None of this was as easy, if at all possible, even 20 years ago. It's much easier to get involved now, much easier to educate yourself, to learn, to find out what's going on in the world and then to make change much easier and that's huge and that's what has shaped fourth wave feminism. Social media allows voices from all around the world to network, meet, discover and create community and join together to fight for whatever it is they know to be right. Representation in all forms of media has improved. It is not perfect and it's important to know that. The media says it still has a huge way to go in a number of different scopes, but it is improving. And it's improving has resulted in strong, influential and coherent female voices in the world, more now than even in the 1990s. What's more, these voices 
are more and more taking to the political stage. And you will hear lots of very angry people every time someone like Emma Watson uh, stands up to, fe- to speak going, oh, what's Hermione doing talking to us about politics? She's just an It doesn't matter. Blah, 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 blah. And these are the voices you should ignore. Um, for, yes, yes, Hermione Watson is an actor. She's also been a woman her entire life, making her uh, arguably uh, kind of unrivaled uh, in, in her ability to talk about feminism. It's 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 an it, it's an impact an, an issue that's affected her entire life. Um, t- trying to again pigeonhole people and say, "Oh, this person is just an actor. We don't have to take their opinion seriously." Is 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 ridiculous. If you don't agree with them, you don't agree with them. That doesn't mean they don't have a right to be heard. It doesn't mean that if the world wants to hear their opinion, it shouldn't. And the people who think that uh, that actors who who want to uh, engage in the political sphere shouldn't, um, well, it's, it's it's frankly ridiculous. Actors who use their power, their influence, their notoriety, um, or, or, or their fame in a positive way, that's incredible. That's something to be seen. That's something worth doing. Um, you can see it in Greta Thunberg. You can see it in Malala Yousafzai. You you can see. I, I realize they're not actors, by the way. But they are people who who are who are channeling um, their 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 fame. And I realize they got their fame through activism, but they're still focusing and channeling it in as positive a way as they can. And that is fantastic. Women in the media are being represented as more and more complex. Now I'm starting to think about things like media and film. They're being more and more complex, nuanced characters. They're more likely to receive a truly positive representation. And this is despite the fact that major elements of audience still don't accept women in certain genres. Wonder Woman and Captain Marvel both got absolutely grilled by elements of audience um, because these were superhero films about women and how unrealistic is that yes yes we can have aquaman who can talk to fish and a a whole civilization under the water but having a woman superhero is unrealistic that's the kind of person we're dealing with as women become more enfranchised and heard and powerful than ever there are still as always men who are kicking back even harder this is true of politics media and day-to-day society day-to-day wow come on mr corbett it reads well, but the space is important. Uh, and day-to-day society. Now, I'm not going to go into modern politics, that is not my place, but if you look at the world, if you look at reactions to women in politics, reactions to um, kind of powerful women, reactions to women in business, it's clear all over the place that Harvey Weinstein being a, a very media focal uh, example that women haven't been taken seriously. In many um, cases, women are still not being taken seriously, but the fight is now on. That's important. Responsible media is media where it's portraying numerous women in multiple roles with varied, interesting and nuanced personalities. Women in sport receive more attention now from the media than they ever have before. But there's still a huge way to go. They are still underpaid. They are still maybe underrepresented uh, on TV. So there's still a distance to go. But importantly, responsible media is also engaging with intersectional feminist issues. Issues of race, issues of gender, issues of sexuality. It must do this by looking at both men and women, destroying gender stereotypes and barriers for both sexes. Nowadays, women are more accepted in politics, on the TV or in the boardroom than ever before. Men, however, are still ridiculed for being stay-at-home fathers, crying in public, taking dance class or wearing a dress. That's what we're going to look at now. Ah, there we go. I expected this a few slides ago. Um, Very few notes on here. I want you to focus on the visuals and the quotes these are quotes that's just a description um you have uh cara delavine uh, you have david beckham and you have eddie Izzard, and you have victoria beckham as well obviously um but the focus is going to be on david beckham and his uh, sarong skirt so uh 
These are three celebrities, and we're going to talk about the treatment of each celebrity um, based on their clothing. Uh, in the not too distant past, Cara Delevingne, Cara Delevingne uh, wore a tuxedo to an event. Okay. Not the usual uh, kind of dress, not the usual skirt, but a tuxedo. It's very much a traditionally male piece of formal wear. When she did, she was described as sexy, daring, and powerful. She was celebrated for it, as well she should be. She looks fantastic. I love the hat. I'm very jealous of the hat um, and the tails and the whole look, actually. It's awesome. She looks incredible. Right? And that's brilliant. And at a time now, we're now at a time in the world where she is celebrated for dressing like a man. In the not too distant past, I mean, you can tell he's a wee bit younger. You had David Beckham going out in a sarong skirt. In an interview uh, with David Beckham in the last few years, uh, it was highlighted jokingly, laughing by the interviewer. Well, he was universally mocked for wearing it. And it's an accurate statement and description. And the way that the, uh, the interviewer is talking about it demonstrates that he believes that uh, rightfully so. And David Beckham is forced then to to defend his wearing of this wrong and actually to say, I would do it again. Uh, I, I liked it. It was comfortable. It was cool. And I would absolutely do it again. And he's forced to defend his wearing of a wrong. And this is interesting. Why is the question we have to ask ourselves? Why is it that Cara Delevingne can wear um, what would be traditionally considered male formal wear and everyone's like, man, that's cool. I mean, firstly, it is cool. And that's 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 just a fact. Uh, whereas David Beckham, actually, if you look at him, he looks great. But yet he was mocked for it at the time and is still mocked for it now by the sounds of it. Why is there this different reaction? And the answer is actually... Um, depressingly simple. Cara Delevingne has been described as powerful, daring and sexy and she's been described that way because her outfit in the eyes of, in, in, in the very patriarchal kind of male eyes of society, elevate her. She is going from a woman to a woman in a kind of man uh, man's clothing. She seemed to be elevating herself. It is a power move, much like we were talking about in second wave feminism. But instead of discarding her femininity, she's combining it with this male outfit. The makeup is completely on point. There's heels, but there's a male outfit. She's combining her femininity with this kind of symbol of status and strength in male community. David Beckham is embracing perhaps uh, femininity. And that is not seen as elevating yourself. He's seen as lowering his status. And that's why he's mocked. Okay? It's as simple as that. That comes down to how the media reports on it. You can look at how the media reports on it. Very positively for Cara Delevingne and still very negatively for David Beckham. And then you can look at the impact of this. Eddie Izzard is a actor, comedian, and uh, kind of political activist, um, very much uh, involved in British politics today. Uh, he is also now, I've put quote unquote cross dressing because, um, well, you'll see on the next slide, um, he, he, he cross dresses, he, he, wears, he wears clothes that, that one would traditionally associate with women. Okay. And that's fine. However, every year, and I was reading articles from 2013 and I think 2015 as well, every year he is physically attacked by people for cross-dressing. The fact that he wears clothes that people uh, associate more with women than with men mean that people attack him. You have to think about media responsibility and how lines like this and outfits like that result in things like this. If the media does not report on things in a responsible way, if it doesn't highlight that actually David Beckham looks great, like, 
he, he, he does. And I bet it looks warm there, and I bet it's not too warm as well. Great, functional, awesome. But if the media doesn't start reporting on things in a more responsible way, people people get hurt. At the time where Boris Johnson uh, described Muslim women as looking like letterboxes, Muslim women in the burqa specifically, I believe, looking like letterboxes, there was a massive spike in Islamophobic attacks. how things are received and described, how they are talked about and how they are conveyed to the world impacts how the world reacts to them. There's a responsibility. Now, I am talking about the news just now, but it is also true of any other form of media. There is a responsibility to the people that you are reporting on or you are portraying to do it in a way that protects them. Until we live in a world where the media can report on or depict female heroes and villains as strong and powerful in mainstream media, and there I'm talking about film, men in whatever clothing they feel comfortable in, film, TV, news, whatever, women at work killing it and men at home raising a child or whatever in both film and TV, women playing football or rugby while men take dance class or sewing classes, or minorities fairly and authentically represented in all media forms, film, TV, and the news. Until the world can depict all of that, we cannot consider the dream of fourth wave feminism in the media achieved. This interview is taken from the last couple of years, and an interviewer is asking Eddie Izzard, famously you've dressed up in women's dresses, and he replies, no, I wear dresses. They're not women's dresses. They're my dresses. I buy them. It's like when women wear trousers. They're not cross-dressing. They're not wearing men's trousers. It's just trousers. Why do we have to attribute a gender to things that are just articles of clothing? That brings us back to gender being a social construct and not a biological one. And when you say that, when you make these points, people go berserk. But there you go. These are the points that fourth wave feminism stands for. These are the points and the ideals and the arguments that are being pushed by fourth wave feminism. Until people like Eddie Izzard are free to dress in whatever way they, they, they see fit without uh, risk of being ridiculed by the media or being attacked by, by, by the average citizen on the street. Until people like Eddie Izzard are, 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 are safe to be who they are, whatever that may be, we cannot consider the dream of fourth wave feminism achieved. Now, there's obviously much more to it. Um, and <laughs> you might be wondering, hmm, feminism, and yet you spent the last while talking about men. It's because in the fourth wave, the appreciation is that feminism has to kind of fight for equality on both sides of that coin. Allowing women to embrace what would traditionally have been accepted as a masculine side of themselves is all well and good. But if you do, and it is all well and good, by the way, that's brilliant. That's massively important. But until you allow men to accept and embrace the what would be traditionally accepted as the feminine side of themselves, if you're not allowing that, you will always have. Well, you'll never have achieved to true feminism for one, and two, you'll always have repressed and angry men, and that would bring me into white male rage, uh, and uh, and we will talk more about that after summer. So, fourth wave feminism and Killing Eve. You're almost at the end. Well done. You've almost made it. We've talked about Killing Eve for the last two weeks, so this is going to be a quick recap. The response to Killing Eve Season 1 has been hugely, but not entirely positive. People have enjoyed the nuanced characters. Nuanced is a word that I heard this week. I had heard it before. I had forgotten it exists, uh, existed, and then I heard it again this week. I was like, Ooh, nuanced. That's a great word. Um, so uh, it has nuanced characters that people enjoyed, strong leads, complex heroes, brilliant villains. And in terms of feminism, it really is ticking all of the boxes we're looking for. There is varied racial representation, non-binary sexual representation, strong female characters, homemaking husbands, as well as powerful men um, and powerful women, women in positions of power, weak and vulnerable men, vice versa. 
It's full of characters filling every nation hole. All right, it's brilliant. However, the key focus for us in Killing Eve is going to be the representation of the two main characters. We will be looking at um, Eve and Villanelle. We'll be looking at their relationship with each other, their relationship with other characters, their placement in the detective and serial killer genre, and how they have progressed feminism on TV. We talked about this during the conference call, if you're in the conference call. And if you weren't, you... And guys, actually, I'll take this moment to... Uh, elucidate on this point. Everything I'm about to tell you here was gone over in the conference call in a lot of depth and detail. Questions were asked, I answered them, I went back and forth. I won't be going into it in as much depth and detail now. If you miss conference calls, you will miss key, co key course information. If you are not there when we're running a conference call, you will miss out on key course information. And that's it. It is your job to keep up with your digital learning. If, when we go back to school, you come to me and go, Mr. Corbett, I have no idea what you're talking about because I haven't watched any of Killing Eve. I haven't done this, I haven't done that. I will have exactly zero sympathy. You have to keep up with your learning at home. I cannot do it for you and I will not do it for you. I had four people from a class of, I believe, 15 or 16 in my conference call. Okay? Four. I'm not going to go bananas. There's no point. You need to keep up with your own learning. If you don't, you will fall behind. If you fall behind, well, that's on you. It'll be up to you to catch back up. I will give you PowerPoints, but I will not teach things that I have already taught. It's not my job to go over myself again and again and again and again and again because you refuse to engage. So, what you're going to do is you're going to write a 750 word essay. 750 words is a minimum. If you go over, that's absolutely fine. Try and keep it under, let's say, 1500, because I know some of you will want to really dive into it, and that's fine. Your task is to answer this simple, well, simple question. It's not simple at all, it's just quite a complex question. Uh, how did any one feminist campaign influence Killing Eve season one? You're going to focus on three areas. The first is you will choose a feminist campaign, activity, movement, or hashtag between 2010 and 2018. We looked at a lot of them here. Okay. Fourth wave of feminism here. You'll choose a feminist campaign. It can be one of them. It can be something else. You will tell me about that campaign. You will tell me the impact that that campaign had on society, our society. And then you'll talk to me about what, ev what evidence can we see uh, from the goals of that campaign in Killing Eve season one? You don't have to focus on episode one. You can focus on any episode in the season. If you want to focus on a few different episodes, that's fine. How you choose to go about this is up to you. Now, this essay is for the 23rd of the 6th, 2020. That is a week on Tuesday. If you were in the conference call last week, you were there when I delivered this this news and you'll have had more of a run at it. If you weren't in the conference call last week, this will be the first you're hearing about it. But again, if you miss conference calls, you'll miss key course information. You have to keep up with your own digital learning. Um, if you have any questions, queries or concerns about anything that I have talked to you about today, um, you can email me and let me know. Um, if you were not on the conference call, and you're not sure about this, just give it your best bet because if you weren't on the conference call and you don't have a very good reason um, and then you email me with questions about this, I'm just going to be annoyed. Um, you should have been on the conference call. Uh, and uh, and guys, there will be a conference call this Tuesday at 10 o'clock. I am taking a register for the calls. Um, and that way, when we all come back after August and I go, oh, have we all done this, this and this? Because on this Tuesday, um, or perhaps it'll either be this Tuesday or next Tuesday, I will tell you the episodes of Buffy that I want you to watch on more for. There might be quite a lot. There will probably be quite a lot. You can just watch the whole thing if you want, um, but it is a big ask considering it's seven seasons. Um, but I will outline some key episodes that I need you to watch before you get back after August, because to make up for the time we have lost over the last month um, where you should have been in my higher class, uh, I am going to have you watch what I need you to watch, Killing Eve season one, which you should have already done, and Buffy, 
and we will not watch them in class. We might watch excerpts, but we will not watch the whole thing. Um, guys, hopefully you have found this informative. Um, I, like, I'm not going to lie this. Like I said, this PowerPoint should have been out uh, two days ago. But, um, but I... <laughs> I thought I'll research it. I'll write, type it up, and I'll kind of record it in one day. Man, was I wrong? Um, looking up feminism and the impact that it's had on killing Eve and Buffy took me two and a half days of checking it against other people and what other people w were saying. My colleagues, and um, both within the department and in other schools, with Scott Larson, for instance, mentioned at the beginning, um, and and reading tons of articles. Um, there's there's huge amounts to find out about the ways of feminism and about the impact they have on media. It's something we will be working on. It's something you will actually need to research in order to complete this essay. Um, but it's well worth doing. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a wildly important part of current events and our history. Um, and so, yeah, um, it's, it's, it's worth it. It's... Uh, one of the things that I hope you come to love about media is that media matters. When we look at issues in the media and we look at how certain clothing options are reported and then what happens to people who perhaps choose less conventional clothing options and we can see people being physically attacked for what they wear, you can see that the media has a responsibility. Media matters. Media makes a difference, and if media is irresponsible, people are put in danger. Um, I hope you have enjoyed this Zoom, and uh, and yeah, like I said, guys, seven hundred and fifty words. I want to email to me. Don't put it in show my homework. I can never find things in show my homework. I spent hours looking for them. It's a very confusing system, and I'm very old. So please just email it to me. Um, you should have my email. If you don't, you can just post on our team's page. Um, above and beyond that guys uh, I wish you all the very best and uh, I look forward to hearing from you uh, and I look forward to seeing you all on Tuesday <laughs>